Mother's Day to all the mothers. Good to be in the Lord's house today again. I want to start with a uh, something I read this past week as it relates to mothers, and then we'll dig in to God's Word together. Somewhere between the youthful energy of a teenager and the golden years of a woman's life, there is a marvelous and loving person known as Mother. A mother is a curious mixture of patience, kindness, understanding, discipline, industriousness, industriousness, purity, and love. A mother can be at one and the same time both lovelorn counselor to a heartsick daughter and head football coach to an athletic son. A mother can sew the tiniest stitch in the material for that dainty prom dress and she is equally experienced at threading through the heaviest traffic with her minivan. A mother is the only creature on earth who can cry when she's happy, laugh when she's heartbroken, and work when she's feeling ill. A mother is as gentle as a lamb and as strong as a giant. Only a mother can appear so weak and helpless and yet be the same one who puts the fruit jar cover on so tightly even Dad can't get it off. A mother is a picture of helplessness when Dad is near and a marvel of resourcefulness when she's all alone. A mother has the angelic voice of a member in the celestial choir as she sings Brahms' lullaby to a baby held tight in her arms, yet that same voice can dwarf the sound of an amplifier when she calls the boys in for supper. A mother has the fascinating ability to be almost everywhere at once, and she alone can somehow squeeze an enormous amount of living into an average day. A mother is old-fashioned to her teenager, just mom to her third grader, and simply mama to her two-year-old. But there is no greater thrill in life than to point to that wonderful woman and be able to say to all the world, there's my mother. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, that uh, in your own way, in your own divine providence, you saw fit for us as a humanity during this day and time to set aside a day to honor our mothers. Lord, I, I readily and admittedly know that not everyone has had a, a good, godly mother. Some folks have not. I pray for them today, Lord. I, I hope that you put someone in their path, a, a grandmother, an aunt, someone that filled that role for them. And for those who did have a good godly mother, we thank you so much. Thank you for godly women in our lives, for the way you use them. They are certainly the greatest force this world has ever known. Bless us this day, God, as we dig into your word. Help us, Lord, to effectively honor our mothers. Thank you for them and for the blessing and for the treasure they are. In Jesus' name, amen. My dad worked with a guy one time by the name of Charlie Powell. Charlie was a pretty good old guy. He was a good electrician, uh, just a, a neat guy to be around. And he was interviewing for a job one time, either on Camp Lejeune or the air station or somewhere. And part of that interview process was, you know, they, if you go going to work for the government, they asked all sorts of questions, right? And part of that interview process was the guy said, Charlie, what is your what is your mother's name? And Charlie said that he was a little nervous and he went just as blank as blank could be. And he could not remember the woman's name. So he looked back at the interviewer and he said, Chief, the only thing I've ever known as is mom known as is mama. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, I don't know if we could put that down on the application or not, but certainly that's true, right? To many, the only thing we know that woman has is mama. And that's enough, amen? Abraham Lincoln once said, no one is poor who had a godly mother. No one is poor who had a godly mother. Let's get into that today. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, open it to the 31st Proverb, chapter 31 of the book of Proverbs. I want to speak to you on this Mother's Day on the essence of a godly woman. Again, that's the essence of a godly woman. 
In the Proverbs, we see a description of what a godly woman is to be, and then we also see a description of what a godly woman is not to be. And we'll get to the godly woman piece here in, in a few minutes, but before we do, listen to the other kinds of women described in Proverbs. There, of course, is the adulteress. The adulteress is described, she is a, a flatterer in her speech. This is a woman uh, who forsakes the covenant with her own husband and instead seduces uh, someone else. There's the noisy woman, the loud and contentious woman with really who no one, nobody wants to live. Uh, cleverly enough, in the 25th proverb, uh, Solomon says that it's better for a man to live on the corner of the roof of a house in a, in a tiny little place than to live in a great big house with a loud and contentious woman. <laughs> also described in the book is a foolish woman. Solomon talks about a rebellious woman. Uh, there's the, the quarrelsome woman. And all of those different descriptions of, of women really are set as the, the backdrop, set in contrast uh, for the, the excellent woman that we read about in the 31st chapter. It's also worth pointing out before we read some scripture together that in the 12th proverb, Solomon teaches that an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is as rottenness in his bones. What's that mean? In other words, nothing better than an excellent wife, nothing worse than the opposite. Amen? Now, before we dig into the, the 31st proverb, let me give you a little bit of background about what's happening here. Verse 1, of course, says, The words of King Lemuel, the utterance, or the speech, or the burden, which his mother taught him. Okay? Now, we don't, we don't know anything at all about King Lemuel. Okay? Uh, he had a good Jewish mama, though. I can tell you that. And, 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 and along with the, the chicken soup, and whatever else she gave Lemuel, she also gave him some really good advice. And thankfully the Lord saw fit for it to be included here. She said to him in verse 3, Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroy kings. So I looked up and, and thought about that. And in ancient Hebrew, what she's saying is, don't commit fornication as a single man. Keep your life pure, she says. Don't give away your strength to women. Those are the ways that destroy kings. She gave him some further good advice in verse 4 when she told him not to drink wine, not to, to drink intoxicating drinks. Why? Because she said it would cause him to forget the law. It would cloud uh, his judgment. It would cause him to, to pervert, pervert justice. Next couple of verses, she tells him to stick up for the innocent, to defend the rights of the poor there in verse 9. In essence, from verses 1 through 9, she says, stay away from alcohol. Stay away from sexual sin and sexual immorality. She says, take care of hurting people. She says, defend those who can't defend themselves. Uh, stand up for the oppressed, uh, oppressed. Support the needy. Deal justly with everyone. She spends the, the first nine verses of Proverbs 31 telling them how to be a good king. Telling them how to be a good ruler. But she spends verses 10 uh, through uh, 31 telling them how to find a good woman. Isn't it interesting that she took twice as long to tell them how to find a good woman as she did to tell them how to be a good king? Which is more important? I can't help but to think of the time that Rylan was just starting to enter the world of dating. We were all together at a, at a football game and a, and a young lady walked by whose clothes were a little too tight and they were a little too short and she had on a little too much makeup. Don't get me wrong, every barn door needs a fresh coat of paint, amen? <laughs> uh, but she it was, it was in excess, okay? And Rylan leaned over, or Adrian leaned over uh, to Rylan and in her best uh, King Lemuel Mama's voice, uh, she said, do you see that girl? And he said, yes, ma'am. She said, don't you ever bring somebody like that home to me. Amen? <laughs> well, King Lemuel's mama has some advice as well, uh, but she says it in a little more of an eloquent way, okay? <laughs> she does so in verses 10 through 31. And it's important for you to see a couple of things about that. There are 22 verses from 10 through 31. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. When you read this passage in ancient Hebrew, 
Each of those verses start with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, verse 10 starts with Aleph, A. Verse 11 starts with Beta, B. Uh, the third letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Gimel. Uh, that is verse 12. And so on and so forth. So every letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the next verse. It would be like in English, uh, 10, verse 10 is A, uh, verse 11 is B, verse 12 is C, and so on. And that was very intentional. That was important because it was an easy way for Jewish boys to learn and memorize uh, this passage. And you best believe that every good Jewish mother made sure that happened, okay? Uh, it was a formula that he was expected to know and, and to sort of have in mind as he's in the world and he's looking for an excellent woman to bring home to mom. And so, let's go through the 31st proverb, verses 10 uh, through 31. And let me show you very quickly six characteristics of a godly woman. The first one I want to show you is her trustworthiness as a wife. Verse 11 says this, The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so she will have no lack of gain. Okay? Now, in the ancient world, wives were not looked upon as God had designed them to be looked upon. Instead, they were not trusted. Uh, the husband oftentimes treated them as a servant. And so there wasn't really this devotion. There, there wasn't this trust between husbands and wives uh, back when this was written. In fact, it was not uncommon uh, for a Jewish uh, husband to lock up all of his valuables when he left so that his wife wouldn't take them and sell them. There's a trust issue there, amen? Uh, if you still do that today, we need to have a conversation, okay? <laughs> And so Lemuel's mother tells him, man, you've got to find a wife you can trust. And that trust is well-founded because she's not going to do anything at all to harm you, to harm your personal gain for your family. And, 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 and men, if God has blessed you with a wife that you can uh, explicitly trust, you have a tremendous blessing. A tremendous blessing. I, I'm thankful for my wife. She has... Full access uh, to, the, to the checkbook. We don't have any credit cards, but when we did, she had access to those. And I completely trusted her with those resources. I know that she would never do anything to violate what we have. She'd never do anything that brings harm to our family. I completely trust her. She'll never threaten what we have gained for the support of our family. And that's what Lemuel's mom's talking about. About the fact that there is this intimate relationship built on trust. That the godly wife should be trusted by her husband. That this is a woman who does her husband good and not evil. Who makes him all that he can be so that his reputation is impeccable in the community. All of that comes from her character as a wife. If a man has a good reputation, it's because his wife has godly character. She's trustworthy. Second, I want you to notice the godly woman's Dedication as a homemaker. And this really takes up the bulk of the passage. Her devotion as a homemaker. In verse 13, she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. Now this kind of talk flies in the face of the, the feminist movement that we see in our culture today, doesn't it? You talk about bullying and, and sexual harassment. Vivian Gornick, a former feminism teacher at the University of Illinois says, and I quote, being a housewife is an illegitimate profession. I always thought being a prostitute was an Ill illegitimate profession. But in our day, being a housewife is an illegitimate profession. And that's the feminist movement today. The cruelest and certainly the most damaging sexual harassment taking place in most arenas today are happening by feminists and their governmental allies against the role of motherhood, against the role of the dependent wife. That's real sexual harassment with devastating results. But in God's order, which is the order that supersedes all others, the woman is devoted to the home. And she's the ruler of that home. She manages the household. Verse 13 tells us that she's involved in making thread out of wool and flax or, or, or linen. And that's so different. It's an interesting 
transition between the 12th verse and the 13th verse because the 12th verse is, is pretty spiritual. We, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but in that verse, she's, she's her husband's conscience. She's uh, doing him good, not evil. Uh, all the, the days of her life, she's devoted to him, making him everything he can be, and she's seeking his spiritual benefit, and she's concerned with his spiritual welfare, and all those things. She, she wants to comfort and encourage and strengthen him, but when we get down to verse 13, it transitions, and now we see her using her hands. She's working for her family. No place in her life for, for laziness. No place in the godly, in the godly woman's life for, for self-indulgence or, or inactivity. King Lemuel's mother says that she should be full of energy in the duties of the home. Whatever the home requires, that's what she does. If clothes are needed, then she purchases the flax and the wool and, and she spins it in the thread, right? And then she, 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 she weaves it on a loom and once it's woven in the fabric, she makes and she cuts the garments and she does all of these things. Why? Because she loves the people for which she's clothing. An older version, the Syriac version of this verse says, her hands are active after the pleasure of her heart. If they need clothes, she provides clothes. If when it's time to eat, she provides food. Notice verse 14. Verse 14 says she's like the merchant ships. Right? She brings food from afar. When I read verse 14, I couldn't help to think about all those wives out there, mine included, uh, who will waste two gallons of gas and three hours to save a dollar fifty on orange juice. Amen? <laughs> but she's trying, right? And we don't knock her. We support her. And when, man, when this verse was written, you had to walk a long way at times to get food. And you certainly had to walk a long way to get spices and things to make that food taste good and taste well. And she's like a merchant ship that takes this, this journey to go get some food and it's way off in the distance and, and she has to walk a long way to go get it. But because of the delight she has in providing and giving out to her family, she willingly does so. And she, she goes great distances to find the very best for the best price. And she brings, she brings those goodies home to her family. That's the godly woman. The godly wife. Verse 15 says more about her devotion as a homemaker. It says that she also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She's up before dawn, right? A lamp. In ancient times, a lamp was always shining in a Middle Eastern home. And it was the, the woman's responsibility. She would add oil to it just after midnight before she went to bed. But she got up before the sun came up and she added more oil to it. And while she was up, she began uh, preparing for the next day. Grinding the corn, preparing whatever needed to be prepared for her husband and for her children and for the rest of the household. There are many things that can be said about her homemaking ability. We don't have time for them all today. Verse 16 uh, talks about her entrepreneurial skills. Verse 17, she's strong. It's really remarkable. The godly woman who works so hard to meet the demands of, of her family, she really is something of a superhero, isn't she? It, it's a curious thing as to how she, she gets it all done. She does it, to borrow the words of the New Testament, heartily as unto the Lord. Sure, she serves and provides for her family, but she does so because she serves and loves her God. He's most important. The third characteristic I bring out about the godly woman is her generosity as a neighbor. Look at verse 20. The godly woman, she extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. Now, I want you to notice something here. It isn't that the poor and the needy come to her. It's that she goes to them. She goes to them to provide. Yeah, she's devoted to her home. She's devoted to her family. But she, she has compassion to those who are not fortunate enough to be in her home or even to have a home. And so she goes to them. I mean, she gets involved in their lives. She provides what they need, this godly woman. Maybe it's food, maybe it's money, maybe it's clothes. The bottom line is, is, is she stretches out her hands to the needy and she has compassion in her heart and she, she wants to help them. She doesn't just 
just touch or, touch or help those who come close. She goes to the needy. And she wants to help her neighbor. The godly woman is an utterly selfless woman. She has compassion for others. And men, if, if your wife, you know, if God is calling her to get involved or support a specific cause, don't you dare stifle that. Don't stop that from happening. Don't get frustrated with her. Don't stand in the way of what God is using her to do. The best thing you can do, not only with this, but with anything, is to get on board and get involved. Amen? One of the ministries that God laid on Adrian's heart years ago was an orphanage in Haiti. and We support them every month. We're good friends with the, the woman who started it. We, we talk about the ministry and we pray for that ministry. And one day, if the Lord is willing, we'll make a trip there and help with that ministry. I'm nervous to do so because I don't believe Adrian would come back with me. <laughs> but it's a ministry that is near and dear to her heart. And she, she loves those people. And man, if it's near and dear to her heart, then it's going to be near and dear to mine because I know what's up. Amen? <laughs> the godly woman, though, she's generous. She's selfless. She cares for those in her community that are needy and need and, and, and that are poor and less fortunate than herself. We're halfway there. The godly woman, her impact as a teacher, number four. I want you to notice that her impact as a teacher. Look at verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. And I start with that verse. It doesn't talk about teaching yet, but... Verse 25 is the platform for her teaching. It's the reason that she does what she does. It says that she's clothed in verse 25 with spiritual character. There's spiritual strength and honor. Why honor? And what does that mean? It means that she's elevated above common things. She doesn't think she's better than others. She just doesn't sweat the small stuff. She's elevated above trivial things. Her life is not all about what doesn't matter. This godly woman has class and, and she has virtue and she has godly character and, and she is spiritually strong and, and she's elevated herself to the nobler issue. She cares about the main thing and she doesn't sweat the small stuff. The kind of person she is. Unlike men, she doesn't fear what may happen because she knows her life is right with God and that secures his blessings in the future. And so, based on her spiritual strength, based on her character, based on not sweating the small stuff, based on keeping the main thing the main thing, according to verse 26, she does what? She opens her mouth with wisdom. And she has credibility because of her life. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and I love this, and literally, on her tongue is the law of kindness. Right? She opens her mouth, she speaks wisdom, but that wisdom comes with kindness. She, she guides her family daily, including her husband, and, and with the words of wisdom from the Word of God, and she is gentle in guiding those she loves most. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan was a, a preacher in the late 1800s and in early 1900s. You may have heard of him. Tremendous, great evangelist, great pastor, led thousands upon thousands to the Lord. Well, Dr. Morgan also had four sons, and all four of those sons went on to become ministers and, and to try to make an impact uh, for God's kingdom. One day, someone asked one of those sons, which Morgan was the greatest preacher, right? To which one of the sons replied, my mother. You see, we see great men of God, and we see great sons of God, and, 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 and our mind forgets that it was probably because there was a strong woman in the house teaching with wisdom and guiding with love. This is the noble, excellent woman. Number five, notice her blessedness as a mother. Her blessedness as a mother. Verse 27 says, She watches over the ways of her household. And she does not eat the bread of idleness. And then, because of that devotion to her home, and because she's not lazy, but because she gives her life for them, look at what happens in verse 28. Her children rise up and call her blessed. And her husband also, he praises her. That's the reward. The reward to the godly woman is the fact that her children and her husband recognize her effort, and they call her blessed. They recognize and know and see what she does. 
And husbands, if you have a godly wife, we have a responsibility to thank her and to call her blessed and to praise her, especially in front of our children. We would never tear down our wives in front of our children, but we would only seek to lift her up to make sure they know how blessed and fortunate they are to have such a good, godly mother. And husbands, if we don't have that good, godly wife, but we have a woman that's working on it, we have the responsibility to continue to encourage her and continue to help her along. Amen? This is a work in progress. If this isn't as something that just happens one day, it's a work in progress for both men and women to grow in the Lord and become the kind of good, godly husband and good, godly wife as laid out here in the third verse from the great preacher and evangelist Billy Sunday tells of a minister who went to visit a home one day. And the children answered the door and they said, You cannot see mother for 40 more minutes. She prays from 9 to 10 and you're here too early. So the minister waited and when she came out of the prayer closet, the light of glory was on her face and he knew why that home was so bright. He knew why two of her sons were in the ministry and one daughter was a missionary. All hell, he said, cannot tear a boy or a girl away from a praying mother. What a blessing it is to have a godly mother that prays for him. Says, I've been doubly blessed in my life and that God gave me a godly mother, and then he also gave me a godly wife, both of who I know pray for me on a daily basis. And if you have a mother or a wife that prays for you, man, you are the wealthiest of the wealthy. You have the greatest of blessings. What a tremendous blessing, greater than any wealth the world could ever offer, and that the women in your life love you and pray for you. And then last but not least, I want you to notice the godly woman's excellence as a saint. Her excellence as a saint. She's an excellent wife. She is a great homemaker. She's a generous neighbor and a teacher and a mother. But notice her excellence as a saint. Starting in verse 30, it says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. It's a simple point here. As Christians... We need to look beyond the superficial. Charm there in the Hebrews, in the Hebrew means gracefulness of form. It's referring to the external beauty. It has to do with the outer appearance which can deceive so many. Folks look good and really all they are doing is covering up a wicked heart. But a mother who fears the Lord, that's the real treasure. Amen? And it says, she shall be praised. And then in verse 31 it says, give her of the fruit of her hands. And let her own works praise her in the gates. We, we think about that. And, and mothers, let me speak to you just for a minute. There is no more difficult job on the face of this planet than being a mother. No more difficult job. But the impact that you make each and every day on God's kingdom, though it may not be known in this world, it will be known in the next. God sees and He recognizes and I would encourage every mother here this morning, don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie that Satan constantly tries to feed you. Satan knows how important your role is and he's going to lie to you and he's going to try to trip you up every step of the way. He's going to tell you that you're not making a difference in the lives of your family. Don't listen to him. You are making a difference. Satan is going to tell you that what you're doing isn't enough and that you need to do more. Don't listen to him. You keep fearing the Lord and you keep loving your family. That's enough. Amen? Satan's going to tell you that your husband is not satisfied with you. That's a lie. If that man has half a brain at all, he knows full well when he's got a good thing. Amen? Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie when Satan tells you that you're inadequate. Don't believe the lie when Satan tells you that you are not enough. Don't believe Satan when he tries to tell you that you are failing as a woman and as a mother. My wife shared a devotion this past week and she shared part of it with me and I couldn't help but to think of her words. You, my friend, as a godly wife and a godly mother, you are a daughter of the Most High. And you are God's greatest weapon against the evil of this world. I'll tell you something else, daughter of the king. You don't have to prove your worth to God. 
You don't have to, to prove your worth to Him. You can take a, a huge breath, a sigh of relief, resting in the fact that you are loved by Him and you are being used by Him. And again, you are His greatest weapon in this world. The mother is. Moms, keep fearing God. Keep loving your family. And remember that you are enough and that you're adequate and that your family and this church is blessed to have you. Keep praying for your children. Keep praying for your husband. Keep loving your family. When no one else notices, God notices. God sees what you're doing. And I've said it before, we all perform for an audience of one, don't we? We all perform for an audience of one. Who do we perform for? For God Almighty, the Lord Himself. Moms, Keep doing what you're doing. And be encouraged. God knows and God sees. And though you may feel undervalued and unappreciated in this world, know that you're not. And know that the real treasure may come not in this world, but in the next. When I believe God will recognize the, the sweet and excellent and good God's above us. And all God's people said, Amen. stand to your feet if you would. Page 280, open your hymn books there with me.